Hello, good evening. Glad to see you. Boy, it's just getting cooler and cooler, isn't it? Almost to the point where it's cold. It's definitely wet and dreary out, isn't it? <laughs> okay, don't mention the word cold, that's fine. Well, we're warm in here. God's love is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We want to ask for that. And, uh, oh, I forgot to count for the Bibles tonight. I know Roque said there was one. I'll ask him. That guy, if you see Roque, he's the young man at the back there that's been checking us in from night to night. If I could just give a, a word about him. He is so awesome. He prints the bulletin and he uh, is doing this, uh, you know, the computer over here. He's on the AV. Uh, he's just, he's just everywhere, you know, <laughs> it's just awesome. Um, no, but God's got a place for all of us, and if it's not, if it's not uh, doing everything, like that guy, uh, he's got something for us, doesn't he? For each one, for each one of us. It's Dennis Ah, uh, Dennis? Ah, oh, Dennis. Good there, Marlene knows. Dennis, here is your Bible. Congratulations, good job. <laughs> Might be another, if there's another, maybe we can find it, but that was, uh, that was good. Okay, well, well let's, let's just pray. Let's get right into our message tonight. I don't have a handout tonight, okay. um, but you can follow along in your Bibles and even check, like the Bereans, to make sure these things are so, right? <laughs> let's pray and we'll get right into the message. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus, again, with boldness, with confidence, with gratitude, with humility. God, we are so unworthy of even being alive in your universe. Your universe is supposed to be perfect and righteous and blameless and sinless. Yet this world has been a, a mar on your universe for too many years. But you knew that was gonna happen and you made a way of escape through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we can come to you as your children, as kings and priests. Wow, thank you, thank you. Tonight, Lord, we ask you that you would just pour out your love in our hearts. What do we have to give to you, God? We are always asking you to give to us. What do we have? We give you everything that we have. We give you our hearts. That's what you say in Proverbs. Give me your heart. Well, Lord, we give you our hearts with everything we are and everything we have. And uh, we ask for your blessings tonight, that you fulfill your promises. Also fulfill your promise to guide us into all truth tonight. Lord, we ask you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We ask you for power to be your witnesses. We ask you that you would accomplish your will, that we pray without ceasing, that we be of one mind and one accord, that we love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Thank you for saying yes already in your word to these things. What a good, good God you are, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah, what a good God. I just love his promises. To think that, that he could say something and it is what it is, just because he says it. Boy, I'm glad I don't have that ability. I really mess things up, how about you? But God does, and he never messes things up. What a good God. I'd like to go back to Revelation tonight. You want to turn there with me? Revelation. We'll go to chapter 12 first. You know, we've talked about uh, we've talked about the beasts of Revelation. We've talked about um, times. We talked about Daniel and horns. I want to focus on this lady and her children tonight. We find her in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Start with a few verses up here and then we'll get down to verse 11. We want to look at her children. She was in a war. Let's just read the first few verses here. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain and gave birth. And they... Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept a third part of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and to devour her, chil her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to the throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she uh, has, a place has a place prepared for her by God that, she, that they would feed her there 1,260 days. Now we've already covered some of this. Now let's skip down to verse 11. <coughs> We have, we have a little uh, description of, of the devil and his anger there and how he, uh, how he was warring with the woman. And then in verse 11 it says, They overcame him. They being... I better just... Let me just read the verse here. I'm going to read verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. And the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Amen? Amen. Amen to that. Now there's accuser of the brother. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. Satan. He's accusing us. Now notice who he accuses us to. He accuses us to God. Now, in verse 11, they, this would be the brethren, overcame him, this would be the devil, Oh, we got up on the screen here. Uh, they, the brethren, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. Lamb. Amen. <coughs> and the power of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Friends, who wants to overcome the devil tonight? You want to overcome the devil? I'm going to, I'm going to share with you tonight the only fight you have to fight. And we see it right here in Revelation. Jesus talks about it in John. And uh, it's just one thing. Oh my God, I just think of other things too. Other verses, I didn't get the slides tonight, but that's okay. Listen to what, they, what their fight was. It's right here in verse 11. It says, ah, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So did they put on their boxing gloves and say, Okay, devil... Let's duke it out. No, no. They, they claimed the blood of Jesus Christ, didn't they? And by the word of their testimony. Now remember, in order to have a testimony, you've got to have an experience. Some sort of experience. <coughs> How are you going to testify about something? You know, if you go to court and you say, I heard uh, so-and-so say that so-and-so said blah, blah, blah. They're going to throw you out. I said, no, sorry, that won't, that won't do for a testimony. If you said, I heard so-and-so say, that could do for a testimony because it's your experience of what you heard or saw. But if you have a testimony of somebody else's testimony, it doesn't count. We need to have our own testimony. And here, these people had their own testimony. They had their own experience, and they claimed the blood of the Lamb. This is our fight. This is our only fight. We don't have to put the boxing gloves on. And, uh, and fight the devil. Christ has already fought the devil. Verse 17. The dragon was angered with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. There it is. We see it again, don't we? The testimony of Jesus. These people, they kept the commandments. They obeyed. And they had the testimony of Jesus. Now, the neat thing about these, these chapters here, you read chapter 12, this woman is introduced, her child, Jesus Christ, is introduced, who rules the nations with a rod of iron, is caught up to heaven, and then you read about her offspring, Christians, the offspring, the offspring, of, uh, the offspring of Christ, of the woman, of the church. Then you read, then right after this, you get into... 13, chapter 13, and we read about the rise of the sea beast, which we already covered, the rise of the land beast. We're talking about the, the papacy coming up out of Europe. We're talking about the United States of America being brought up after that time, during, um, not, uh, not during, uh, brought up after that time and in a place of sparse population. Do you remember that? Okay, so just, just kind of review. Now, if 
after this picture, John sees more about these righteous people. That's us, amen? By faith, that's us, amen? amen. By God's grace, that's us. We want to be those people. We don't want to be a part of the beast system. We don't want to be uh, shaking hands with the Antichrist. We want to be a part of God's people. So let's pick this up in, in chapter 14, and we're going to look at some characteristics of these people tonight. We'll see some of it on the screen. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll pick it up in verse 4 on the screen. John says, I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now, who is the lamb? Jesus. He saw Jesus, a lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, saying, or no, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. We want God's name on our foreheads, not the name of the beast, right? And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing with their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one can learn this song except the 144,000 who were, who were redeemed from the earth. Now look with me at the characteristics. We have one here in verse in verse 3. They were redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Amen. That's us. Next, verse 4. Verses 4 and 5. Follow along with me. You'll see it on the screen as well. Here's the characteristics of the redeemed. Are you ready? These are the ones who were not defiled with women, they, for they were virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and of the Lamb. And in their mouths was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Who wants to be without fault? Amen. Who wants to be before the throne of God? <laughs> Amen. Now, I've compiled a little list here of the characteristics of these people. And I want to point something out here, and I'm going to give you a little pop quiz here on the screen. Which one of these characteristics is something that they are doing, not just something that they are? You see them there? Follow. Yeah, that's the verb, right? Follow. Look at the other ones. They were not defiled. That's a characteristic of who they are. That's a descriptor of who they are, right? Uh, they were redeemed. That's something that happened to them. Isn't that good to know that you know, we don't have to redeem ourselves, do we? We have a redeemer. They were redeemed. They're the first fruits. That's describing who they are. Uh, in their mouth is found no guile. Describing them. Well, they're without fault before the throne of God. The one thing, the one thing that these people are doing out of all this redemption and, and purity is they are doing what? Following Jesus. That's it. They're following Him. And they're following Him everywhere he goes. This is something that they just continue to do. Jesus turns left, they turn left. Jesus turns right, they turn right. He goes faster, they speed up. He slows down, they slow down. They don't want to get ahead of him, they don't want to fall behind. They don't want to turn the wrong way. They say, Jesus, wherever you go, I will go. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi? And... Uh, Ruth told her daughters-in-law, or Naomi told her daughters-in-law, you know, my sons are dead. I'm going back to my own country. You just go home to your parents. What, what are you going to do? Wait till I marry somebody else and have more kids and then you'll marry them? That doesn't make any sense. Just go home. One of the daughters-in-law went home, but Ruth said, no, no. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. She was making this commitment. Like we want to make to Jesus through baptism, right? Yes, Lord, I want to commit to you. I want to follow you everywhere you go. This is a great, beautiful story. And this is what the people in Revelation did too. This is what we want to do. Follow Jesus everywhere he goes. Not only because we see it here and we say, oh, okay, so that's what they do. I better do that. Well, yeah, we probably should. We definitely should. But friends, why wouldn't we want to, right? Jesus is so perfect and beautiful and glorious. The more we know him, the more we love him. I'm going to 
when we know Him, when as it's our privilege to know Him, our hearts melt. And we can even ask for that. That's uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, there's a promise that says, I will give them a heart to know me. If you don't feel you know God well enough, you say, and, and maybe find that verse specifically. I don't have the reference, but I know it's in Jeremiah. God, would you please give me a heart to know you? I want to know you more. And will he say yes to that? He already has, hasn't he? He's already said yes. Now, let's go to the New Testament. We've got a great place here in John 15. Jesus speaking to his disciples. This was John 14, 15, 16. This is like Jesus, the last things that he really got to say to his disciples before he went into his trial, uh, his, his tribulation, his trial, and his, uh, his death. So let's look at John 15. Jesus uses an analogy I think we could all understand. And we're talking about somebody who follows Jesus everywhere they go. We'll just start out in verse 1. We'll read a few of these verses. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Right. Jesus uses this analogy. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Obviously, he's using symbolic language, right? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So God is doing the work, isn't he? Christ is the vine. We are the branches. If we're not bearing fruit, we'll be cut off. Paul uses this illustration later when talking to, uh, I think, the Romans. And he says that the Israelites were cut off and the, the Gentiles were grafted in. And he was talking about, you, you be careful. <laughs> we were talking about that, weren't we? But uh, you be careful that you don't get proud, prideful about being a part of Christ uh, and being grafted in because... Uh, you know, if you're not bearing fruit, then, then you'll be cut back off. So we want to be bearing fruit. I mean, we understand bearing fruit is like doing good things, right? I mean, that's, that's a good thing. I mean, who likes to be productive? Like, all the men are definitely going to be raising their hands. Oh, yeah, you know I do, right? <laughs> but we all want to be useful and, and have a meaningful life and get done with the day and say, yeah, I, that was worth living, don't we? Yeah. Nobody wants to get to the end of the day and say, Boy, I am an entirely useless person. Nobody wants to say that. That's a bad feeling to have. And some of us have had those feelings on certain days. Maybe certain periods of our life. It's God's will that we're productive. Amen? Amen. It's God's will that we bear fruit, that we do good things. That is His will. But that's not our fight. Just follow along. Next couple verses, 3 and 4. That's not our fight. It is God's will that we bear fruit, but it's not our fight. You are already clean. Now we're talking about pruning, right? We're talking about pruning. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. Because of the what? Word. Friends, remember what Jesus said in John 17? He said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Friends, you want to be clean? Spend time in the Word of God. This is our, this is our soap right here. It's a cleanse us. You're already clean because of the Word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Here's our fight, friends, right here. Is it God's will that we bear fruit? Yes. But God has not told us, hey, bear fruit. Jesus didn't say, do good works. Okay, so he has in many places. But his bidding is not, okay, God, I'll, I'll go do what you said. I'll see you later and go work for God, right? Boy, sometimes, especially as God-loving people, we want to do good things for God, and we run away from God so we can do good things for him. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. We can be so busy doing God's work that we lose sight of God, can't we? Pastors can, be, uh, pastors can be guilty of this as much, as, as much or more than anybody else. You know, as a pastor, just the way our denomination works, the tithes and the offerings go to our conference headquarters, and then they are distributed out 
to um, to evangelism and, and different things and, and pastor, the pastor salaries. And so um, the, the point is, I get paid to work for the church. It is also my calling from God first. But a pastor, it would be easy for a pastor to say, oh, I better produce fruit because, you know, my paycheck's on the line. You hear what I'm saying? Or even if you're somebody who, uh, who, who doesn't get paid and you voluntarily serve in the church to say, oh, I, I, better, I better do good things because my salvation is on the line. Or I better do good things because my reputation is on the line. Or I, I, better, I better serve the church because uh, uh, they need that. The church needs that. Which all may be true. But it's not the bottom line. The bottom line is we need to be abiding in Christ. Friends, we can work ourselves to death doing good works. And then end up losing our salvation because we're not abiding in Christ. Christ can do through us when we abide in Him a zillion times more than we could do without Him. And he says it this way, apart from me you can do nothing. Here's a, here's a quote from a book called Desire of Ages. It's a, um, a biography of the life of Jesus, taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and putting them in, in chronological order. And this is, uh, this is just a statement in there that kind of sums up what, uh, from, this, from this part of Scripture that just sums it up real nicely, in my opinion. I just like to share it with you. God desires to manifest through you the holiness, the benevolence, the compassion of His own character. Well, thank you, Lord. I would love that too. Yet the Savior does not bid His disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them to abide in Him. So what's our job? To do good or to abide in Him, right? The life of Christ in you produces the same fruit as in Him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. And does that make sense, spouses, when you spend time with each other? Doesn't it make sense that you rubbing shoulders together and spending time start to speak like each other and think like each other, or, or friends, or mother and daughter, right? We end up, as the, as the Old Testament says, uh, proverbially, uh, by beholding, no, that's the New Testament. By beholding, we become changed. I was thinking of a different one. Um, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But the, the same idea is all, all there. When we're spending time with Christ, we're going to become like Christ, especially when Christ dwells in us. Now, let's keep going here. Verses 5 and 6. 15 verses 5 and 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Friends, this is our fight. You gonna put you gonna put gloves on and fight the devil? No, no. You gonna do any good work? No, no. You know, our works can be really tainted, even our good works can be tainted. We're doing it, it could be out of fear, it could be out of jealousy, it could be out of uh, pride. But when we got Christ doing it through us, and we're surrendering to Him, and we're allowing Him to work, and we're just humble, we say, Lord, I'll let you decide if when and how things happen. None of that stuff can be present. Now, it might, as a temptation might pop up, but if we're focused on Christ, then we come back to Him, don't we? All right, verse six. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. We don't want that, do we? Jesus isn't talking about bearing fruit here. He's talking about abiding in Him. When we abide in Him, we will bear fruit. Now, 7 through 9. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. This is the same thing that we talked about about prayer, wasn't it? Friends, when we have God's Word with us, when we have it in our hand, when we have it in our mind, when we have it in our heart, and we're praying to Him, and we're saying, this is what your Word says, guess what Jesus says? He says, if my words abide in you, and you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. What, are we, what do we wish for? We wish for God's will. And it will be done for you. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. God wants us to bear fruit, right? He wants us to do good things. And so prove you are my disciples, just as my Father loved me, and I have also loved you. Abide in my love. You hear what he's saying here? He's saying, my Father wants you to bear fruit, so abide in me. Abide in my love. You hear that? Who wants to have an effective life? Who wants to have a fruitful Christian experience? Of course. How do we do that? We abide in Christ. Now, a couple more verses, then we're going to try to get a little practical from Pastor Tom here a little bit. Just in my own thoughts. Uh, 10 and 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Isn't it nice to know that even Jesus kept the commandments? Isn't it nice to know that, you know, we're called to do something, guess what? Christ did it too. Came to baptism, he calls us to be baptized. He did it too. Even though he didn't need to be the greatest prophet that ever lived, John the Baptist said, I should be baptized by you. But Jesus said, It must be done for all to be fulfilled. Uh, pray. Jesus had to pray. We have to pray. Jesus had to pray too. Jesus kept the commandments. He calls us to keep the commandments too. Verse 11 These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. And then your joy may be more may be made full. Isn't that nice to know? God wants us to be happy. Amen? Amen. I want to be happy, don't you? Yeah. Now there's this song out there. It's a really catchy song. I'll probably put it in your head if I sing it. And I might go sing it, I won't, but uh, it just uh, oh, there's another one. Uh, my dad used to sing to us. You know, maybe more than a few songs about happiness. Um, do, 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 do. Does anybody know that song? <laughs> That's a fun song, isn't it? You know, everybody wants to be happy. And uh, here's the little song. Okay, we won't go that far. Uh, my dad used to sing it back to us when we got grouchy when we were kids. But, uh, you know, God wants us to be happy, doesn't he? You know, some of the things that God calls us to do really put us in a hard spot sometimes, though. Don't they? Sometimes he says, do this, and you're saying, well, I'm doing this. And if I do what you say, then I'm going to lose out on this thing. Are there things that we lose out on when God calls us to something else? Absolutely. Now, ultimately, it's for our best good. You think about what Jesus said. He says, uh, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny himself daily. Take up his cross and follow me. That doesn't sound very happy, does it? But ultimately, it really, truly is. We don't see it at first. Sometimes, and probably even some of you here now, uh, have a decision to make, and you're thinking, should I do that or not? You know, I've been, we've been sending out decision cards. I have another one for tonight. We'll get to later. I love those because you guys have been putting prayer requests on them. We've been praying for those, for your, for your children. have been praying for um, yourselves, and been praying for... Um, other family members, trying to think of all the things we've been praying for. And God hears those prayers. But also, it's good for us to make decisions, and God calls us to make decisions. And I just, I want to say this in, in, in real seriousness. Who knows what the first commandment is? Have no other gods before me. The first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Right? When we are called to do something that we don't feel like doing, something that we don't want to do, something we don't know how we're going to do it. And we have a choice to make. The choice isn't just, am I going to do what God says or not? It's, am I going to put God first? It's just the first commandment. Now, who's going to be God in your life? Are you going to be your own God? Or is God going to be God? Maybe some, of, maybe some of the decisions that we have to make at, at times have to do with our stomachs. Is my stomach going to be God? Or is God going to be God? Maybe it has to do with, uh, with our job. Is my job, is my job work schedule going to mandate my life? Or is God going to be ruler of my life? Does that make sense? Is a, a friends or, or loved ones, are they going to be the ones who 
tell me what to do? Am I going to be so afraid of, of changing or doing something different that they're going to rule my life? Or am I going to allow God to be the one? And as we're talking about tonight from Revelation 12 and Revelation 14, you could ask the question this way. Am I going to follow my own ways or the ways of the world or the ways of my family or the ways of my, 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 my life? Or am I going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes? Jesus is calling us in our decision making to follow Him. And you know what? It really is a simple choice. It's not always an easy choice. There's this battle between the spirit and the flesh all the time. And if it's not one thing, it's another, isn't it? And part of this is like an internal battle. It's like having multiple personalities sometimes. It's like part of me wants to do this thing, and the other part of me wants to do something else. And you read Romans chapter 7. Paul explains the same thing. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. He goes back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he just, it's almost like he just gives up. Ah, wretched man that I am. Who's going to save me from this body of death? And you know what the answer is? Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So you're not alone when you're sitting and thinking, am I going, what decision am I going to make? I read in the scripture that God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I read the scripture that he wants me to eat a certain way. He wants me to live a certain way. He wants me to think a certain way. And the, the choices are simple, as difficult, as complicated as it might feel sometimes. The choice is really simple. Are you going to do your own way and follow your own things and follow the way of the world, the way of your life and the way of others? Or are you going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes? That's our choice. Simple. Good thing God has made it simple for us. The people we read in Revelation, they follow the Lamb. I want to be one of those people, don't you? Amen. I know that you do. Now, let's move just in our minds, just for a minute, to the tabernacle. I want to share something with you about the tabernacle. This is a model of what is in heaven, the holy temple in heaven. Now, if you see this picture, you can see uh, a few pieces of furniture in there. I bring them to our attention tonight because these were things that were happening continually. There was continual, uh, the burning of the lampstand was happening continually. The presence, the bread of the presence of the, on the table of showbread was there continually. The smoke from the uh, altar, the altar of incense was going up continually. So these were some things that had significance, which had representation. Now somebody tell me, if, if you put your, your mind here, now I think we talked the other night, um, last night, did we mention about the smoke in the, in the revelation, the smoke of the uh, altar ascending and being mingled together with the prayers of the saints? Did I mention that one? I don't think I did. I had it in my in my periphery, but it didn't get in. In Revelation, we read that the prayers of the saints are mingled in, in the heavenly sanctuary with the incense, and that it is being taken up to God. Oh, it would have been a good one for talking about praying without ceasing. The, the smoke of the incense represents prayers, and it's a sweet-smelling savor to God. And as they go up continually, it reminds me of what Paul said, pray without ceasing, right? So one thing we want to do is pray. Can somebody think of a Bible verse that says something about light, that, that Jesus had mentioned about us and light? Let your light shine. Yes, very good, yeah. You are the light of the world, right? So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Why do we do good works? To glorify our Father. So light represents, it could represent in one way, good works, uh, witnessing, uh, showing others what, uh, what, how good God, our God is. Testimony, if you want to make it real simple. And what does bread represent? Jesus' body, yes, he is the bread of life, right? Very good. And uh, the, the Word of God is also bread. Remember when Jesus said in his temptation, the uh, devil said, hey, turn those stones into bread. And, the, and Jesus said, man shall not work, live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Christ is the bread of life. And this is our bread of life. The reason I bring this up is this. 
when you look at our Christian experience and you tie it together with the tabernacle, you see that there's a con something continual that we want to be doing. And I would say that this is how we abide in Christ. One is definitely through His Word. We already saw that in John 15, didn't we? If you abide in me and my Word abides in you. Right? Also on top of that, prayer. This is, and we see that right here, this, this, the um, altar of incense. This is the way we hear from God, and prayer is the way that we respond back to Him, isn't it? Now, what in here tells us about our testimony? Which of those three would tell us about our testimony then? You can say it, go ahead. The lay stand, yeah, of course. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, right? So look what we've got here. We've got the, uh, the, in, the in Revelation, we see these, this people. This pure people, they're virgins. Now that doesn't mean that they never had uh, intimate relations with their spouse. It means that they were not defiled with, uh, with, uh, with sin, right? Where was I going with that? Oh, these, these pure women, uh, these, the pure offspring, it doesn't say they were women, it that they were offspring. These pure, this pure offspring had the testimony of Jesus. They followed the Lamb wherever He went. And here we see, uh, we see the testimony, we see prayer, and we see Bible study. So I want to I hit on a couple of these now with, um, with these are just some of my own thoughts. Well, some of these have scriptures on them. Uh, you can write these down. I should have had a handout tonight. I will, I will print off the handout for this one. You can get it on Thursday. But here's, here's some things that we can do. We were just talking about this one the other, uh, the other night. We are talking about the Bereans, right? We just mentioned it again today. Say, uh, spend time in the Bible daily. This is something we can see in the Bereans. It says that they were more noble than the others because they, uh, they study the Scriptures daily to see whether the things were so or not. So let, let's be doing that. Now remember, I'm, I'm talking now... Oh. Sorry. I told you. Uh, I'm talking now about doing, right? I'm going to say do this, do that, do the other thing from, from Scripture and from experience. But remember, these, the, the reason we want to study the Bible is not to check off our checklist and say, okay, Pastor Tom said be in the Bible daily, or, you know, Brian's were, I better be too, check. That's not why we're studying the Bible. Why are we studying the Bible? To be in Christ and have His Word in us, right? To abide. This is this is the practical boots meets the ground, rubber meets the road uh, thing here. So uh, spend time in the Word of God daily. I would add to that memorizing Scripture would be a good one. The scripture says, "I have hidden Your Word in my heart that I might not sin against You." Right? Uh, that might be done through songs. I think that's a great way to memorize Scripture. Putting on three by five cards, uh, whatever might work for you. Now, some of you, some of you out there, I know that some of you are saying this right now in your head. Oh, memory. Uh, no, no, no. I don't have very good memory. I, I don't think I can do that. And I might be younger, and in my brain might be more ready to memorize scripture. But uh, if you have a hard time with your memory, then exercise your mind. By memorizing scriptures, it will help you fight off uh, Alzheimer's disease as well. And if it's God's will that you memorize the scripture, which we know, this is just one here. I've hidden your word in my heart. There are many places. Uh, Joshua 1 8 says this the, the, the word of this testimony shall not depart from your mouth uh, as well. Hebrews 4 12, I memorized it today. God is sharper than any two edged sword. Amen. Amen. Very good. Uh, these, these, these things, it's God's will that we memorize Scripture, that we put it in our hearts. So if it's His will, and you don't think you can do it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> ask, right? You ask Him. You say, it is your will that I memorize? I'm really not good at memorizing. Will you help me do that? Will He say yes? Of course, because it's already His will. Okay, now, let's also expect increased faith. Romans uh, seven or Romans ten says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. So when we spend time with the word, we'll have increased faith. Who wants increased faith? I want more faith, friends. Sometimes in some experiences in our lives, we go through hard experiences. We 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 
we lose things that we've had or we are crushed by life experience, we need more faith. Amen? We need faith. And we can find it in the Word of God. We can expect that when we study the Bible. Also, we can expect to be convicted as well. Remember, that's a gift from God, isn't it? Jesus said that when the Spirit of truth comes, or uh, He'll guide you in all truth. Another place He says that uh, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. We saw that one just a couple nights ago. Hebrews says that the Word of God is... Hey. <laughs> yes. It pierces us, doesn't it? Yes, that's your verse right there, Terry. Praise the Lord. Uh, that that, would, that, that when, when we read the Word of God, God speaks to us. And He touches us. It's like a sword, a two-edged sword, splitting us and opening us up and just exposing us for who we really are. We need that. You know, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and try me and see if there be any way to me. Lead me in your way everlasting. Uh, we want that. I, I want to be convicted. Sometimes there are things that we're doing in our lives and we don't even realize that we're really hurting God, that we're hurting Christ, that we're hurting ourselves or others. And we want those things brought to our attention. And we can expect a better relationship with God, too. Jesus said to the Pharisees, He said, You search the Scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of Me. This is, this is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. When we read the Scriptures, we'll have a better, deeper, fuller relationship with God. Is it His will that we study His Word, that we read His Word, that we spend time in His Word? Yeah. yeah. If we have a hard time doing that because... Our kids wake up before we do and they go to, they stay up later than we do. I don't know how that is. They take a nap in the middle of the day. That's why. I'm still sleeping. They're waking up. It's light outside. Good morning, Papa. And my, my daughter always goes, woof, 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 woof. She's doggy first thing in the morning. And then I'm laying in bed. My son, he's like me. He falls, he, he lays down, he's out. My daughter, on the other hand, just like my wife, man, she's like laying in bed like, Tell me another story. And I'm like telling a story about something, and then I'm talking about a screwdriver in the sky. <laughs> and uh, uh, the point is this we need to find time to spend time in God's Word. If you don't have little kids like me, you know, maybe you're retired and you've got all the time in the world, then praise the Lord, you know. If, if you find it hard to find time in the Word, Ask, thank you. Yes, amen. Ask, 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 ask. It is just what we spend time in the Word. Now, let's look at some thoughts here from, uh, we already covered this uh, last night about prayer. So we'll go through this quickly. But, uh, you know, when you pray, just be yourself. We don't have to pray long, drawn-out, repetitious prayers. We don't have to uh, think that we have to present a, a Gettysburg address to God. Remember Peter, when he was walking on the water and he started to sink, he had a three-word prayer. Save me, Lord, save me. Right? So you just, just speak your heart to God. Just pour out your heart to God. You know, we talked about praying publicly, or praying together with others. I recommend that. But also pray privately, too. Remember Jesus said uh, to go into your prayer closet, right? And some people have, like, prayer closet, like a war room. Anybody seen that movie, War Room? Oh, that was an encouraging movie. Uh, about uh, prayer. That's, that's good. Uh, you know, have, have times of, of corporate prayer where you pray with a prayer partner, you come together as a group. And uh, Mr. Marty Heim over here and I have been talking about having in December, hopefully, a, a week of prayer where we'll just come together and pray. But let's have that private time too. You know, there are things that we tell God in private that we won't mention <laughs> during those other times we're praying with others, right? Uh, we need to be intimate with God and, and expose ourselves to Him and say, God, this thing that I can't really share this with anybody, I feel so ashamed about it. It, it just hurts me so much, but I want to share it with you. Please hear my heart. Friends, if you're praying like that, He will become your best friend if He's not already. If you're praying like that and He is your best friend, your relationship will only grow deeper and deeper. You need to have those times of quiet, personal, private prayer. It will deepen our relationship with Him. We're talking about abiding, right? Mm. We're talking about following Him wherever He goes. Some of the places He might go might be to, to a Sabbath-keeping church. Some of the places He might go might be to Guatemala. And you might call Him to be a missionary in Guatemala. Some places He goes are deep within 
the dark recesses of your heart. He calls us to follow him there too. You hear me? We're not just talking about things we do on the outside. Sometimes he goes deep within us. He calls us to follow him to those places so we can get real. <laughs> get real with him. We need that. Boy, that's abiding in Christ right there. I already mentioned something about no need to have long, repetitious prayers. I repeat in my prayers. I pray. You know, when I have a prayer list, I pray down these names. I repeat those names. And my goal is five or six times a day. I'm not talking about repetitious like that. I'm just talking about, you know, rote prayers. Even reading the Psalms and praying through the Psalms. I don't think that's uh, you know, a bad thing either. I'm just talking about just deride, just say it to say it and be done, check it off. That, we don't want that. We want to be real with God. He wants to be real with us. Open our heart to Him just like He's a friend because He is our friend, isn't He? And uh, two more. Have faith that He already knows what you need because He does and He's promised that. He's promised that in the Sermon on the Mount. And try different ways to pray. Uh, mix it up. Keep it interesting. Uh, praying the Psalms is a, is a neat one. You know, you just find a psalm that, that hits you, and you just start reading through it, and you read one verse, and then you stop, and you say, yes, Lord, that's what I want too. You know, search me and try me, oh God. Yes, Lord, search me and try me. I know David said that. I want to say that too. And just read through the, the psalm and pray it. A lot of these psalms are just prayers. You can pray other people's prayers. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just want to make sure it's not dry and formal and, and a checklist thing. We want to dive deep into God's love for us. So, uh, so let's pray. I don't know why there's nothing there. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Here's what Martin Luther is, is quoted as saying. He said, I have so much to do, I shall spend three hours in prayer today. And that was more, not less. You know, when we got a lot to do, Let's not neglect prayer. Let's up our prayers. I was reading through the message, but I'll listening through the message Bible this morning. The message is a paraphrase. It's not a literal translation. It's not a word for word, even a thought for thought. It's somebody's own interpretation, which is fine. Uh, it's a nice, a nice way to experience the Bible. He said something like this in there. He said, when things get hard, pray all the harder. I like that. I like that. And Martin Luther, he's saying here, boy, i got so much to do today, I better spend three hours in prayer. Let's not neglect it, amen? There's power in prayer. We already covered that. Let's keep going. Oh, boy, there's nothing there. Okay. In order to be effective, you must remain connected. We want to remain connected. Now, there's something about abiding in Christ and following Him wherever He goes that will probably happen in your life at one time or another. Let's think about, we go to Matthew chapter 4, if you want to follow along, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Jesus calls some disciples. Remember when he called the fishermen, what did they do? Here, Matthew chapter 4. He said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. What did they do? They didn't just follow, what else did they do? They left their nets. When we follow, we can, there's something we gotta leave. It, it may be anything, but let's let's follow their example and follow Jesus and leave their nets. I had on the other slide. Excuse me. Here's another one, Luke chapter five. Now this is Matthew. This is in the book of Luke, but the story about Matthew. Luke chapter five, verses 27 and 28. He called Matthew too, and look what Matthew did. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, this is Matthew, Levi, Matthew, uh, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So what did, what did Levi, Matthew do? He left all. I mean, hello, you're right in the middle of work, right? I mean, so were the, so were the fishermen. They were right in the middle of work. He's right in the middle of work. Okay, all the money's there. He just left all. He just left it and followed Jesus. Wow. Jesus, Jesus calls us, friends, to leave certain things. He says, you got, if you're following me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. He says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, 
he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, if you were a tax collector, maybe, maybe Matthew realized this, maybe he didn't. The things that he was doing really were availing nothing. I mean, in the long run, right? You look at the world, you look at the history of the world, you look at Revelation, you see that someday Jesus is going to come again, but Peter says that the elements will melt with fervent heat. That means everything. So your house, your car, now you need your car right now. You know, you get a flat tire, you're going to want to get it fixed, right? But someday, what's a car? I mean, it's going to be burned up, right? By the brightness of his coming. Uh, what else? Yeah, our roads. I'm glad they paid this road out here a couple years ago. It was a mess. There's some other roads around here that are a mess, right? <laughs> but someday, I'll burn up. Your job? Burned up. Bank account? Burned up. Right? These clothes? Burned up. These old bodies? Burned up. Get, get a new body, amen? The thing is this. This life is nothing. I mean, it's something, but it's all going away. Jesus says that he makes all things new. That means the old is gone. The new has come. And we want that new life. We can have that new life now. But let's not get tied down to anything in this life. You can't take it with you. I got a little joke for you here for a second. Now, understand this. I believe from the Bible, when you die, you're sleeping in the grave. That our loved ones are resting in Jesus. They're waiting for the resurrection. This joke does not follow that thought, but just, it's a funny joke anyway. This rich businessman dies and goes to heaven. He goes to the pearly gates and he's got two large suitcases. And the angel at the front gate says, Sir, nobody can bring anything in here. Oh, but please, these are my most valuable possessions. I, I worked all my life for these. No, no, no. I'm sorry, you just can't bring anything. Oh, please, please. They're so important to me. Well, let's have a look, the angel says. So he bends down and he, he opens one suitcase and he opens the other and they're full of gold bars. I mean, I don't even know how he was carrying those things. They must have been so heavy. And the angel looked at him and he said, Why would you bring pavement into heaven? <laughs> <laughs> Our most valuable possessions are just things that, that people walk on in heaven, right? <laughs> Why would you bring pavement into heaven? The streets of gold, right? Our most, our most precious elements, God, God uses them as, as building material. Look at it, the city, oh boy, we didn't have in this series a one about heaven, about the, uh, the streets of gold and jasper and the crystal sea. Oh, well, that's one of my favorite topics. You know, that's where we're going someday, isn't it? And Jesus said this, he says, don't lay up your treasures on earth where moth corrupt, thieves break in and steal, or where rust corrupt and moths I'm getting mixed up here. But don't lay your treasures on earth, right? Or where, where tires go flat, where, uh, you know, backs break and, and roofs leak. Lay your treasures in heaven. This life is not really worth anything for us, friends. The only thing that's worth anything in this life is our salvation and the salvation of those whom we love. And I'm just going to tie in just another plug for prayer, <laughs> because we talked about it last night. In our priest, our royal priesthood of being called to be people who are interceding on behalf of others. What else can we take with us besides souls? What else can we take besides us but other people? Nothing. We can't take our car, even our most valuable possessions are just pavement. So let's be praying. Let's be spending time talking with God. And this other stuff, yes, you might need to change a flat tire. Yes, you might need to replace a leaky roof. That's just stuff we have to do in this life just to get by, just to survive. But where's the true treasure? It's in lives. And it's all, it's either get burned up or it's being recreated new. Amen? Amen. John 5, 19, Jesus, uh, therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, a son, the Son 
can do nothing uh, of himself unless it is something he sees his father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Even Jesus himself, friends, could not do things by himself. He had to remain in his father. He had to see what his father was doing and follow. You, you see that here? He was following his father, doing what his father did. What consolation to us that if Christ said himself, truly, truly, this is for certain, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. If even Christ couldn't do anything of himself, how much more can we not do anything of ourselves? Our fight, our only fight to fight. We want to be pure like we read in Revelation. We want to be people without guile. We want to be redeemed from among men. We want to be the first fruits of God's uh, resurrection, of his creation, of his, of his uh, universe, of his love for us. The one thing that we must do is abide in Christ. Amen. If we can do that, that's the fight. That's the fight. I could mention something about the devil, and then now he, he tries to pull us away from that, too. He knows. He knows what our fight is. And he tries to complicate it and make it seem, seem sophisticated and confusing at times. But the thing is, it's actually simple. Just like the choices are simple. The only fight we have to fight is just abiding in Christ. Just following him wherever he goes. If it's to Mongolia on a mission trip, if it's um, you know, to a Sabbath-keeping church, it's in the deep recesses of our heart. Follow him there. That's all the cards back there. You got the cards back there, Leon? Great. Bring them out here. Yeah. Do we have pencils too? Or is there a pencil yeah. box up there? Great. You know, I'm just I'm going to ask you tonight. We got just a couple minutes left, and uh, you know, this is Jesus' call to us. He says this to you and to me. Follow me. Follow me. Now. There are different ways that we do that, but what I'm going to ask you to do is just fill out the card. It's a card you've seen before, uh, but you can put your response on the card. And uh, please, 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 put a prayer request on the back. I need more prayer requests. Some of our prayer requests are being answered, and then I have to mark them off and just say thank you. So if you have a prayer request, please write it down. If you've got a prayer request for somebody else, write it down so we can, so we can uh, pray for them. Send them off to our prayer warriors, too. But just take a minute to write down on that card a response of some sort. Jesus is calling us to follow him. I'll just give you, I'll just give you a minute to do that. We prayed one, we prayed two, and we prayed three. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But uh, I, got, I got a text from one of, the, one of the couple with an update. And they said, hey, guess what? This thing happened to yesterday, and, and here's what happened. And they named off what happened. I said, that was an answer to our prayer. And then they named off something else that had happened along with that. I said, wow, that's exactly what we prayed for. And named off something else, and it was exactly what we prayed for. You know, God doesn't always answer that way. Sometimes he answers differently. But we saw it so clearly. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I'll just tell you this. It is so exciting to be praying to God and asking him for things. It's so exciting to be praying and asking on behalf of other people and to see how he's answering. So and it's just so exciting. So that's... Uh, that's not a prayer request anymore, that, that particular thing. Um, so I need more, so please put a, put a prayer request on the back. I see, some of your, I see some of your heads still down, but I'm going to go ahead and close with prayer tonight. And then please make sure those cards get in so that we can uh, see your responses and so that uh, we can be praying for those things on your prayer request. Even if you don't have a response to put down for some reason, if you do have a prayer request, you Let's go ahead and take a moment to pray together, and then you can finish. God in heaven, you have done it all. You've made it so simple for us to be saved. You've made it as possible as possible by giving us one fight to fight in. 
to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ, to dwell in Christ, to endure in Christ. So tonight, my simple request is this, that you would accomplish your will in us, that we follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ, wherever He goes. We know that that's your will. And if that's our will as well, Father, then you, of course, you'll say yes to that as we continue to seek you. Work with us to accomplish that will. That we may be saved in your heavenly kingdom someday, but that we also may experience that wonderful life that you have for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I've got some bad news, and then I've got some other bad news. We're not going to see you tomorrow. Here. And we're almost done with the series. Oh, I know, right? I mean, it's kind of bittersweet, you know, being, succeed, being done, you know, we succeeded in, in finishing, uh, you know, hurrah to everybody for sticking it out. 26, uh, all, you know, if you were here every night or whatever, 26 is a lot of meetings. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the same time, it's like, what am I going to do with my nights? Have a date with my wife or something? Yes, it's good to me. Uh, but so, don't come tomorrow night, but come back Thursday, and you can look on your sheet and see what they are, and also, if you miss any, if you have missed any, or you want to review any of our series, go to kenhorstchurch.org, and you'll find it under the uh, media section. All right? So, God bless each of you. I'll be in the back, I can shake hands, and hopefully get your cards with the prayer request, too. So, everybody have a good night.